They were two very different godfathers, separated by 4,000 miles of ocean. John Gotti was the Teflon Don, a New York mobster who adored public attention and defied lawmen to get him. Totori Ina was a peasant from rural Sicily, a boss who operated in the shadows. In the late 80s and early 90s, it required two very different approaches to bring them to justice. In the United States, crime fighters were unflagging in their pursuit of Gotti. If you disregard my phone calls, I'll blow you in the house up. In Sicily, it would take a revolution by the people of Palermo to put Riina behind bars. John Gotti was a violent and reckless hoodlum from his earliest days. A young gangster called Henry Hill was drinking in a bar when he first came across the teenage Gotti. All this thing, John comes in, that puts up, work anyway, goes over to the card table and starts whacking the guy with a batter of, with a batter of pipe or something. Just beating his head hit to death. He almost killed the guy. Um, he, he might have killed the guy. I don't know. The guy might have died. You know, they might have thrown him in the trunk that night. I don't know. Gotti had broken an unwritten rule of the mob. Violence should only be used when there were no witnesses around. And he walks over, apologizes to me. <laughs> Blood play all over the place. That was the first time I've ever, I had ever seen him. You know? You know, he had a long black, uh, you know, top coat, leather, leather top coat, you know. I mean, he, he just looked part of a, you know, of, uh, of a gangster. It was clear Gotti feared no one. To Henry Hill, it marked Gotti as a man destined for the top. He was a man on the rise. He was, you know, he, he had his own crew. He, you know, he was, he was going to be somebody. You know, you just knew it. I mean, he, he had that presence. But one man stood in the way of Gotti's rise, Paul Castellano. He was the head of the Gambino crime family, the most powerful of all the mafia families in the US. Castellano was an old style hood, a mafioso who disguised his crimes behind a veneer of respectability. Paul wore two hats. He could mingle with lawyers, real estate, businessmen, developers, doctors, talk their language. Then he wore his Gambino family hat, and he could sit there and discuss why this guy's got to get killed and say, okay, he's got to go. Gotti would have to eliminate Castellano to become boss. But Gotti was not the only one who wanted him out of the way. In 1983, President Ronald Reagan declared war on organized crime. The target was the Mafia's ruling body, known as the Commission. On it sat Paul Castellano. Under America's tough anti-Mafia RICO legislation, crime fighters could prosecute Castellano and the other bosses for running a criminal enterprise, if they could prove the Commission was meeting. The commission was so secret, the only proof the FBI had of a meeting taking place dated from 1957. Then, one morning in May 1984, at FBI headquarters in New York, Agent Joe O'Brien received a call from a mole inside the Mafia. He informed me that there was going to be what's known as a Mafia Commission meeting in a couple of hours. Uh, I didn't believe them, to be honest with you, because uh, this was pretty much unheard of. These guys cannot afford to meet. Um, that could be very incriminating to them. 
If the FBI could get a photograph of this meeting, it would help destroy the commission. O'Brien and a fellow agent, Andy Curins, staked out this building, a small house on Cameron Avenue, Staten Island, that belonged to a relative of a senior Mafia Don. The agents hid in the back of an unmarked van a few hundred yards down the road. Dan was right back here, right about where the white car is, right in front of the uh, 54 there. That's about uh, where we were parked. And we had a nice straight shot. There were no cars at that time. We had a straight shot down the, uh, down the street to 34 camera. So we sat there for uh, three hours, so about 4.30. And then they started coming out crime family by crime family. The top men in the Gambino the Lucchese, the Colombo and the Genovese families all emerged. Then finally our uh, long-awaited uh, guest of honor, if you will, uh, Paul Castellano came out. Castellano was the boss of bosses. He was like the king strutting out. You could almost envision a carpeted area. It was a real show of of how the mob operates and mob protocol. It was very exciting. Uh, I don't know how Andy managed to keep the camera as still as he did. He used this shoulder right here as a tripod, and uh, I just didn't breathe uh, for the longest period of time. Castle wasn't in any, any big rush. Took a couple of puffs on the cigar and uh, got in the car and drove off. The photographs were dynamite. The FBI knew that such striking visual evidence was just a thing to put in front of a jury. In February 1985, the FBI seized all five members of the commission. Agents O'Brien and Curins arrested Castellano and drove him to FBI headquarters in Manhattan. In the car on the way to FBI headquarters, Castellano heard a radio news bulletin about the arrests. It was the beginning of the end of Castellano's reign. turned to Joe, I remember, and he says, is that true? Is that true? You listened to my private conversations. Prosecutors say the recordings are of superb quality. Today you could almost know. hear him, like, groan. Castellano awaited trial, at which the photos would be key evidence. power vacuum had been created at the heart of the Gambino family. The situation was ripe for war. If the New York mob wanted to know what a mafia war was like, they needed to look no further than Sicily. Here, the mafia's boss was Toto Riina, an elusive, psychopathic killer from the town of Corleone. Corleone was a mafia stronghold set high in the mountains of central Sicily. It was the place that gave its name to Marlon Brando's character in the film The Godfather. Riina's cruelty earned him the name The Beast. Riena's crime family had seized control of the Mafia in a vicious war. In Palomo in the early 80s, the streets were awash with the blood of Riena's victims. During one six-month period,